Right now, the data center is the scene of dramatic change. Virtual servers and storage are everywhere. Cloud computing has become mainstream, and something called big data has moved in. IT pros are scrambling to respond. But while the data center has been getting a makeover, the underlying network has remained largely the same. The result, at a time when more is being asked of IT than ever, network performance too often is not helping. But there is hope, thanks to software-defined network technology and an emerging standard called OpenFlow. Hi, I'm Stan Gibson, Senior Managing Editor with the IDG Enterprise Custom Solutions Group, and I'll be your host and moderator for this interactive webcast. Joining me are Cindy Barovic, Program Vice President for Enterprise and Data Center Networks at International Data Corporation. Welcome, Cindy. Thanks, Dan. Stuart Raphael, Business Development Executive for IBM System Networking. Good to have you with us, Stuart. Thank you. And Don Clark, Director of Business Development at NEC. Welcome, Don. Thank you, Stan. Before we hear from these experts, just a quick word about this webcast. This is an interactive webcast, and that means we want to hear from you in our audience, and you may participate in two ways. First, should a question occur to you at any time, just type it into the Ask a Question box on your screen and then press the Submit button. We'll do our best to answer it during the Q&A segment of the webcast. Second, this webcast features two audience poll questions. When the question appears on your screen, please select the answer that seems right to you and then press the Submit button. We'll tally and discuss the results instantly. And we're going to go now to our first audience poll question right off the bat, and that should be appearing on your screen momentarily. All right, and the question is, why are you interested in OpenFlow software-defined networking? Um, and please choose all that apply. And your choices are, been reading about it, uh, colleagues are talking about it. Sounds like it can solve my networking pain points. Have, have pending projects that could benefit from OpenFlow software-defined networking. I'm skeptical and I want to know more. Or OpenFlow is revolutionary and I want to be in the forefront. So uh, please choose all that apply and then hit the submit answer button. And uh, panelists here, uh, what, what do you think we're going to see people voting for here? Uh, some awareness, um, eagerness, skepticism, what do you think? Don, Stuart? Uh, Stuart, I think they're going to say they've been reading about it. Okay. All right. Cindy, what's your sense of things? Well, I, I, think, I think they've certainly been reading about it, and I think they're very curious if it can help solve some of their networking pain points, and, uh, and, and that they'll be, that, that'll be one of the key uh, areas that the respondents check. Yep, I, I, I see the same that customers are looking for how far advanced software-defined networking really is. Okay. All right. Well, I see seeing the results here. And um, uh, as, as we surmised, uh, many people have been reading about it at 68.1%. Um, colleagues talking about it at 27.2%. Uh, OpenFlow is revolutionary, and I want to be in the forefront. Uh, some daring people out there at 45.4%. Uh, and uh, skepticism, uh, but want to know more, gets 22.7%, and uh, have some pending projects that could benefit from OpenFlow and SDN, 13.6%. Any, any thoughts, any further thoughts about that poll before we move on? Uh, Stan, this is Cindy. I think it's a, I think it's a great sign, right? That uh, that the respondents, you know, every everyone is, has been reading about it and interested, and then yet there there really there shows a a great desire to uh, learn more and uh, make it successful. All right, all right. Well, Cindy, you've been doing research on this topic. Could you please share with us your findings? Stan, thanks so much. It is a pleasure for me to be here today. I have been at IDC for over 20 years, primarily looking at data center network requirements, and I have to tell you that I think that we're at a point in the industry where the stars are aligned and it is really the right time for customers to start to evaluate OpenFlow and what it means for their network. So I'll be speaking for the next 20 minutes or so, and what I wanted to do was start out and talk about the intelligent economy and what at IDC we see as driving growth in the IT industry over the long term. And, you know, we'll talk about some specific opportunities 
that customers see in terms of cloud and private cloud deployments, but they do have some challenges. And we'll discuss those challenges and how the data center network really needs to change in order to address those challenges. And finally, I'll leave you with some essential guidance. So first, I'd like to start off and talk about the intelligent economy. And at IDC, we believe that the intelligent economy itself needs intelligent IT. And if you look at this figure here on the right-hand side of your screen, it really talks to the evolution that we've had in the IT industry. So back from the, the mainframe terminal era where applications were really just supporting the back office of the business to the LAN and PC client server era where we started to get more and more end users involved. And now we're in this phase of the IT industry where IT is becoming pervasive across all industries and it's really transforming the landscape of business. So whether we're talking to in retail in terms of connected lifestyle brand, we're talking about really having IT at the front line of patient care in the healthcare industry, and certainly in the energy industry in terms of the emergence of smart grids. And by 2020, IDC believes that the IT market will reach $5 trillion. It will actually be $1.7 trillion of that market will be based on the intelligent economy. And what's happening is really this whole idea that IT is now seen as an equal partner to the business. So for some companies, IT actually is the business, but for others, it is it is an equal partner in terms of driving revenue growth. And so where we used to have IT being responsible for email and billing and finance, it's now really on the front line of the business, and it's critical that IT is up and running at the speed of the business in order to not be seen as a barrier. And as part of this intelligent economy, it's really about embracing social, mobile, and, and collaborative applications. And as companies start to think about how can they take advantage of this intelligent economy, they they really are starting to look at cloud and cloud technologies. And as you can see, this figure specifically looks at North America. How are you going to be spending your IT dollars? Is it for a traditional IT infrastructure build out or are you looking at cloud services? And in fact, um, over the next 24 months, we see this growth in not only the use of public cloud services, but the use of private cloud services as well as using a hosting service and growth in the hosting services. So, you know, cloud services will expand across all industries and businesses. The use of public cloud, many of the companies I talk to start to look at public cloud as a way to offload some specific functions from the IT department as IT is now getting closer to the business, running more of those business-centric apps. They're offloading some apps to a software as a service provider or out into the cloud. And worldwide revenue for public IT services is going to exceed $72 billion in 2015, so just a continued growth. And right now, 77% of all North American businesses are using some sort of public cloud service. And it's certainly an area that we are watching very closely. And the other area that is even more exciting, if you will, is, is when you start to think about this transformation that is happening within the enterprise and within the enterprise data center. And essentially what it is is it's, it's changing your data center architecture to make sure it is ready for the business going forward and make sure it's prepared to help your own business prepare for that intelligent economy. So there's some few key attributes, if you will, of building your private cloud data center, one of which is really starting to look at the individual infrastructure components that you invest in and try to reduce the cost, if you will, of those. So looking at your server infrastructure, how can I reduce the cost of my server infrastructure? How can I reduce the cost of my storage infrastructure? And how can I look at and optimize the network? But, but that's just kind of the first step, if you will, in terms of the standardization 
and stability of the architecture and organization of this new data center. And with the hope of once you have done that, you are able to better match your IT costs with your business requirements. And then finally, as you migrate and you truly do have a private cloud infrastructure, you're bringing a new level of automation and resiliency to the overall data center and to the business so that you can respond in that 24-7, if you will, intelligent economy. And so as I've been talking to customers, they uh, certainly see the benefit of the private cloud, but there are some challenges, and they're really across the board. If you look at the number of virtual machines deployed, server virtual machines, in 2010, the number of uh, virtual servers outshipped physical servers. But now we're starting to see this virtual machine sprawl, this growth, if you will. And yet, we still only have a fourth of servers that are actually virtualized. So there's something that's actually stopping that from happening, despite all the benefits of the server optimization that you get with server virtualization. We have a growth and an explosion in storage. File-based storage is growing at a compound annual growth rate of 64%. And uh, quite frankly, automation is not taking hold. We have, we have a barrier to the uh, deployment of automation tools. Only about 20% of data centers now are using automation tools to achieve that VM mobility. And this explosion in the VMs is really is starting to change the network requirements in the data center. And there is a perception that security in a multi-tenant architectures are just too risky. So what I'd like to do is move specifically to talk about the data center network challenge. And we, we see a couple of things happening, one of which is there are new traffic patterns in the data center, the first of which has to do with the application side and SOA-based applications. And we have now these federated applications that are changing the traditional traffic patterns in the data center, and we have more of this interaction, if you will, between applications and between servers. And we want to support virtual machine mobility. We want to get to this on-demand dynamic cloud data center. And yet the today the data center network is blind to the virtual machine. And as you can see from this picture on the slide, is we ha what I found is that we have an IT ecosystem that is separated, that we have changes in application architecture, we have the IT infrastructure in terms of server and storage, uh, the industry really looking to optimize the compute, optimize storage, um, and optimize the network, coming out with faster and greater performing networks. But none of these are working together. And specifically, that's a problem on the data center network where we've built up a high-performance network, uh, a reliable, stable network, but in fact, it's very static and it is tiered. There are redundant costs in the network, whether we're talking about redundant cabling, redundant switches, redundant adapters, server adapters. And this is creating, you know, an ongoing management complexity where the the network is, is starting to be perceived as a barrier, if you will, to creating this on-demand network. I know I was talking to one network manager, and he said, I don't want to be the bad guy. I don't want to be the one that says no if if my company wants to deploy this new revenue-generating application that's going to be rolled out to thousands of salespeople. I want to make sure that I am supporting the business. And the data center network today, unfortunately, is not able to support the business, and it really has limited visibility into business applications. And so as we start to think about what does the data center network need to look like going forward, it's really about this cloud-ready alignment, if you will. And, you know, sometimes when I talk about this alignment, I think of everyone in IT on the same team, everyone working together for a common goal. It's really about the applications, the server and storage infrastructure, the network, as well as this product and security policies all working in alignment to further that uh, business-ready data center. So as I start to think about, okay, well, what does this mean? Specifically, what does this mean for the data center network? 
as I said, it needs to be cloud ready. So it needs to be virtualization aware. The network needs to understand the virtual server, not just the physical server port. It needs to be application aware. The network needs to understand the applications that are uh, flowing over the network and uh, create the the appropriate policies and performance that's appropriate for that application. Certainly, it needs to be reliable and resilient in terms of a fault-tolerant network, a high performance, whether, you know, 10 gig, 40 gig, um, but then the overall infrastructure itself needs to be high performance. It needs to be simplified, right? So one of the things that you know, I hear again and again from uh, customers is this idea of simplifying and easing the deployment of the network itself, but the ongoing end as well, the ongoing management of the network so that uh, it is, it, it, you're not managing individual switches in the network, but you're managing the, the network uh, as a cohesive entity. And certainly it has to be flexible. So, uh, you know, everyone is under cost constraints, so we need needs to be flexible and that there's some level of investment protection if th- things change. And it also, it has to be built for the future unknowns. I mean, five years ago, we, did, we would not have known that we were going to be having devices on the network, such as Coke machines. And so, you know, you need to build the network so it's flexible to support um, applications that will come out in the future, users or devices. And the, this whole idea of security is, as we start to change that data center network, we need to have centralized control. The control itself needs to be proactive and not reactive, as well as supporting multi-tenancy, particularly in public cloud services, but also as you build that private cloud, you're talking about supporting different business units within one data center, and, and you need that level of multi-tenancy. So there are a few products. There's certainly many products coming out on the market to address these challenges. Certainly all of your providers have recognized that there are challenges on the data center network. And what we see emerging is this whole idea of software-defined networking. And software-defined networking is really about defining a network that allows the dynamic exchange between the applications of the network. So the applications can tell the network who they are, what they're doing, and the network can make appropriate decisions based on that. It is all, it, at its very heart, it is about decoupling network logic and policies from the underlying switch hardware. And so it's the separation of the control and the transport functions. And what I find that's so exciting is, you know, the second bullet here, which is really about delivering programmable interfaces to the network. So the network can take advantage of this rich uh, development that's out there to, to be flexible enough to handle the future own unknowns of whether it's users or applications in support of this intelligent economy. And a great example of software-defined networking is OpenFlow. OpenFlow is an open source protocol. It was uh, started by a group of folks at Stanford University, uh, Deutsche Telekom, and NEC. And right now it's managed and overseen by the Open Networking Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization, and it's backed by, you know, all the many of the leading networking software and telecom providers. And it, it it's a, a specification for, for switching that was developed um, – back in 2008, and it's really, it's starting to grow, and, and it's, an, it's a great example of how network virtualization can help add intelligence to the network, and it, as I said, as I described software-defined networking, it provides a separation of control from the data and forwarding plane, and it starts to con- simplify the configuration of the network. It provides centralized, which is really key, that centralization, control and visibility, and it provides the necessary business alignment for network managers so that they can be in a position to say yes when their business needs them to deploy a new application rather than being a barrier or having it take too long 
to propagate those changes throughout the entire infrastructure. So OpenFlow, you know, as I see it, 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 OpenFlow makes the network a team player in this overall IT infrastructure. We talked to a company recently called Genesis Hosting. They've deployed OpenFlow, and I thought it would be really interesting to uh, share with you what, what we heard from them. So Genesis Hosting, they're an innovative hosting company. They have this, you know, build your own cloud approach to hosting. And they, they needed to do two things. Uh, first, they needed to scale capacity to support growth in the business. Obviously, as soon as they can scale capacity, they can gain more revenue. And they needed to make sure that, you know, once they had a customer, that their time to service was very quick or instantaneous. Um, but they, they did have a problem. The, the time it required to implement complex networking configurations was it was it was just took too much time it was becoming expensive and they also found that uh, the spanning tree protocol was becoming a roadblock for them to to make changes quickly so what they wanted was a new solution that would allow them to add new services but they didn't want to upgrade their existing hardware. And they also wanted to make sure that they could improve their network uh, service level agreements, make sure that that was going well. So, and of course, I mean, they're a hosting company, so it needed to support multi-tenancy, and they um, needed to make sure that network was, was performing well. So they, they, they evaluated a number of alternatives, and what they decided on was the NEC uh, programmable flow, and this is an open flow product. And the reason why uh, they did this, one of the major attractions, is they felt that with programmable flow from NEC, the entire network acted as one big switch. So... What that brought to them was the fact that any changes in, in customers or changes in policies would be automatically propagated throughout the network. And uh, it also brought them simplified configuration and um, policy management, and it, it eliminated the need to maintain complex spanning trees. So, you know, the, Genesis Hosting was very happy. What they found was they could increase the efficiency of all the ports because the ports on the on their network could now all be used for application traffic instead of having to have some of the ports dedicated to connectivity and it also i think for the most part they were extremely happy with the fact that it re- reduced the network administration time um, by 100 hours weekly so as you can imagine this company the data center is their business and uh, the fact that they could reduce the time spent on network administration was just a huge win for them. And I think it's applicable for all. This, this case study, while they're a hosting company, I think is applicable for, for really anyone that's trying to build a next-generation cloud-ready data center. So as I look at the data center network going forward, um, as I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm very excited about OpenFlow because I think um, the stars are aligned, the need to move to a cloud data center, the need to have a data center network that can support the intelligent economy, the network itself needs to be intelligent, and if you're if you're going to move at the speed of the new economy, you need a simpler approach that reduces network implementation and ongoing management costs. The fact that the network itself can be flexible and uh, in the face of change, in the face of the unknowns, I think is really important. And also that you know you have that alignment between the network and the application is really key for next-generation IT requirements. So I thank you for your time today, and I will pass this presentation back to Stan. Well, thanks, Cindy. Just a quick reminder to you and our audience, if you have a question about Cindy's research, just type it into the Ask a Question box and then press the Submit button. Cindy will do her best to address your question in the Q&A segment of the webcast. Next, we're going to hear from Don Clark of NEC, joined by Stuart Raphael of IBM. They're going to share with you the details of how some innovative customers are using new open flow technology to address some of the concerns that Cindy described. Don Stewart, 
Stan, thanks a lot. NEC is a global provider of IT solutions uh, from a broad range of products. Uh, we're headquartered in Tokyo, and in the U.S., we have headquarters in Dallas uh, with offices across the U.S. Uh, NEC is a leading provider of both IT solutions, servers, storage, software infrastructure, and of networking equipment from switching to WDM equipment. And as a large integrator of systems for cloud solutions, we understand the challenges that the network has posed as we try to integrate IT and networking solutions. So we believe that SDN is an important approach to integrating cloud solutions. Stuart? Thank you, Don. IBM System Networking provides networking solutions that uh, provide a connectivity uh, environment for server-to-server -server connectivity, servers-to-storage, and storage-to-storage, -storage, along with interoperability with the core network. When IBM Smarter Computing Solutions are equipped with IBM System Networking, Ethernet, and Fiber Channel products, this really brings a lot of speed to the access layer, the distribution layer, and also the aggregation layers where servers and storage uh, devices are connected within the data centers. We see that clients that deploy these Smarter Computing uh, solutions using the IBM system networking portfolio realized improved economics in their environment. They also get uh, higher network performance, uh, lower latency, uh, less complexity in their environments, as well as uh, the ability to save on energy and to have better management of their environment. At this time, we're going to switch to Don, who's going to talk about the OpenFlow technology and software-defined networking. Thank you, Stuart. NEC and IBM are collaborating to bring an open flow solution that leverages the software-defined networking to give customers more choice in the way that they build and deploy their networks. We'll talk now about how we deploy open flow networks using our combined solution. As Andy mentioned, the open flow protocol allows us to move the intelligence of the network up into the application stack. By leveraging an open standards-based solution, we create an ecosystem that allows customers to build best-of-breed solutions. The OpenFlow protocol leverages the flow table of uh, an OpenFlow-enabled switch to create decisions on how packets get handled across the network. And OpenFlow standardizes a common set of functions that will evolve with the standard over time. The combined NEC and IBM OpenFlow solution consists of switches that are OpenFlow-enabled, a secure channel connection, and a controller that manages the open flow of entries on switches. If we take a look at how open flow began, we can see the work done by Nick McEwen at Stanford uh, to develop uh, some really interesting applications for using open flow. Open flow began in Stanford University as a means to really increase the innovation uh, happening in the network. With OpenFlow, they were able to run experiments at scale across multiple networks to be able to do network innovation much faster than they could with traditional networking equipment, to be able to run production network traffic on experimental networks, and to be able to discover new protocols that allowed them to create new innovations and be able to test them. Uh, researchers from a number of campuses across the U.S. and around the world were able to control their own campus networks and to be able to run experiments between campuses that allowed them to prove out ideas that heretofore were not able to prove in production networks. With the arrival of the ONF and the work done by NEC, IBM, and other vendors, uh, we've seen the OpenFlow move from the R&E network industry into the uh, adoption of enterprise data centers. And there we see a different set of applications being uh, embraced. Uh, IT is looking for better alignment of the network and uh, higher agility, like Cindy talked about. We're seeing predictable performance being a key application for OpenFlow networks. And the ability to virtualize programmable networks uh, to reduce the challenges of virtualization. Uh, Built-in security is a common requirement and a, a high benefit of OpenFlow. 
and we've seen dynamic innovation as part of what OpenFlow provides to our customers. Well, Don, you've made a strong case for the power of OpenFlow technology, but uh, for any standard, it has to have uh, industry-wide support, really, to gain traction. Uh, what can you tell us about the industry support that OpenFlow is getting? Stan, the ONF was uh, founded uh, from the work being done at Stanford, but the board consists entirely of uh, some of the largest data center managers in the world, Deutsche Telekom, Facebook, Google, and others provide the ecosystem uh, from which the ONF standardization activity is now taking place. And the membership includes many of the largest networking equipment companies providing new insights on how the standard can evolve. With OpenFlow, we can now create a network virtualization plane that allows us to view the network as one aggregated switch. Uh, and creates a level of abstraction that allows us to define virtual networks. Uh, by doing this, we hide the physical network and protocol details, allowing system integrators and network administrators to just manage what they care about and to abstract away a lot of the complexity of the network. This allows us to create higher levels of automation and integration with existing systems. Stuart, you want to talk about how OpenFlow enables programmable networks? Sure, Don. Thanks. The data center and the enterprise can really realize smarter networking with OpenFlow. Uh, as we've heard earlier from Don and Cindy, OpenFlow allows us to, the ability to automate and centralize the way that we actually control the network. So the IBM and NEC OpenFlow solution really allows us to abstract the physical network and effectively pool the network resources so that we simplify that in infrastructure. And by simplifying that infrastructure, we're able to adapt it to the workflows of the business and the business logic of the organization. So the network really becomes a naturally virtualized, fast boarding plane that's really tightly coupled uh, with the firm's IT platforms. Now, when you take a look at these things as they relate to the data center and the enterprise within programmable networks, we talked about automation, we talked about centralizing the way that we control the network, uh, it really provides some significant CapEx and OpEx savings. If we take a look, for example, at CapEx savings, uh, some of the benefits that we see here, for example, are that we've eliminated traditional Layer 2 challenges. Uh, as we know that Layer 2 and working with Spanning Tree really takes away from the capacity of the network. And now, with the OpenFlow technology, we can improve the consumption of the network by over 50%. Uh, we also have the ability here to highly utilize nodes on the network, whether they're servers, firewalls, or load balances, because with traditional implementation uh, technologies, we tend to have bottlenecks. But these bottlenecks are eliminated with OpenFlow. Additionally, we provide uh, commoditization of the network. Uh, this allows customers to build their networks, build their logical topologies uh, on top of the physical gear independently, so there can be changes to both the vendor gear if the cost goes down, and that will not have an effect on the business logic of the organization. So you really get this decoupling between the software and the hardware that it's running on, and this is really uh, very important to CapEx savings. We also see dramatic reductions in space and power consumption with the ability now to design these open flow fabrics and take lower cost products and substitute them for high cost chassis platforms uh, and also to give great a great deal of flexibility to the customer in, in the way they would like to lay out their network. Additionally, we've seen the significant savings that we get through virtualization on the server side. And now we have network virtualization with OpenFlow. So we're able to provide this virtualized network where we can instantiate the flow of traffic on layer one through layer four, uh, uh, matching, if you will. And we take out the constraints that happen in layer two in, in, these, uh, in these protocol designs. So again, through being able to utilize your nodes in the network, whether they're firewalls, uh, load balance or servers uh, more effectively, to be able to take advantage of commoditizing the network when, when price goes down and functionality increases, you can swap the network out without any effect on the logic of the network. Being able to get 
the network savings through virtualization, and being able to deploy the network and add switches in the network as, as demand and as capacity requires, eliminating the layer two challenges, we significantly reduce the capital expenditure of, of the network. The other area that is also very important that we see customers uh, delighting in with OpenFlow with the IBM and NEC solution is actually lowering the operating expense. Uh, we can automate the network, as we've heard earlier, provision the network, such as in cloud environments. And by being able to automate and provision, we reduce the amount of professional services costs that occur when you're trying to deploy new services in the network. This creates faster speeds of agility for deploying services, and it creates a cost savings. Additionally, by decreasing the complexity of the network, because we have that automation and we have that ability to provision, we also reduce the amount of troubleshooting time to resolve problems. And as I spoke about earlier in the previous slide, we saw reductions in power consumption as being a way to save. But now you can build these scaled out topologies. You can add capacity in the network. The switches or the devices in the network can be automatically discovered and provisioned. And then you also have the ability to take idle flows of traffic, move them off of lowly utilized switches or servers, and having those devices now idle and switched off allows you to save money in the data center because you're able to, again, take these flows from those points in the data center where the devices are lowly utilized and move them to areas that are more actively used. The other very important aspect to lowering the operating expense is something that's very unique to OpenFlow, and that is the ability to do location-free appliance pooling. You're able to provide new services on demand because you're able to take appliances and not have them tied to the physical location of a port or a server. And this gives you complete autonomy of the network and total control of the environment. Well, the capabilities of OpenFlow are impressive. Um, what about people using it in the real world? Can you tell us about consolidation that people are achieving? Stan, we have deployments from a number of customers where we've gained some experience in how OpenFlow can be used in enterprise and data center applications. We saw with our customer Nippon Express, they were undergoing a data center consolidation, uh, and what they needed was the ability to merge multiple tenants on the same network uh, without increasing complexity in the overall management of the network. And what they found was that building an open flow network allowed them to create multiple tenant views with different policies running on the same physical gear. The benefits they saw from OpenFlow were dramatic. They saw both uh, decreases in unit space and power consumption, uh, and they also saw technical benefits, uh, including failure recovery time dramatically being reduced. And as Stuart mentioned, the uh, complexity of the network greatly decreased, so the outsourcing fees required for managing that network also greatly decreased. Stuart, you want to talk about Travella? Yes, thank you, Don. Travella is a maker of high-speed messaging appliances and systems. Uh, these systems are used for uh, e-commerce, risk analysis, and global trading. What Travella did was actually benchmark the IBM and NEC OpenFlow solution against uh, traditional layer two switching, and they found some really key benefits in that benchmarking. They found that OpenFlow affords them deterministic latency, and this is very important for Tavella and their messaging fabric. They also saw to predictable network performance because they can now assign policy to network-based flows. And they did this testing by actually having uh, messaging information going back and forth and then injecting ambient noise, and they found that the open flow fabric allowed them to delineate and prioritize the correct traffic and give it the right performance so that the messaging rate was absolutely superb. The other thing that they got in this testing was uh, uh, link failure recovery uh, scenarios. They actually found that the open flow network convergence times were much faster than traditional layer two networks. So again, open flow, they saw this as a very innovative technology with the IBM and NEC solution that afforded them deterministic latency, predictable network performance, and rapid convergence. 
Another company or client that we actually met with that gave us some significant uh, uh, responses over their use is Celerity. And Celerity actually delivers machine-readable event data, and it has to be done at extremely ultra-low latencies. Uh, they take corporate earnings, for example, or energy statistics, and they codify that in a machine-readable format, and they distribute it to their user community. So as events are really breaking, they rely on the fastest possible network performance that they can get. And what Celerity saw with OpenFlow is that it actually gives them the flexibility of an application with the performance of a switch. So they used the IBM and NEC solution where IBM provided the switch and NEC provided the controller. It showed them that they could actually accelerate the information delivery as much as a thousand times faster than conventional server-based applications. Don, would you like to speak to Stanford? Yeah, Stanford is another great example of how OpenFlow is maturing. Stanford has deployed OpenFlow networks in one of their buildings uh, for some time. And it was based on that experience that the network administration team at Stanford decided that it was time to deploy a parallel OpenFlow network for campus services that gave some of the benefits of OpenFlow to the broader community at Stanford. Their goal is to build a vendor agnostic network that decouples the services that they can provide from the underlying software running on each individual device. Uh, they also have a couple of killer applications. One is bandwidth on demand, that is the ability to create circuits on demand for very large file transfers between the organizations on campus and the large pipes that connect to Stanford. They also want to be able to build shared infrastructure and tear down the current challenges associated with providing that service in the network. Well, Don and Stuart, I'd like to ask you this on behalf of people in our audience who might be considering OpenFlow. What should people be looking for in an OpenFlow solution? Stan, customers should be thinking about both the features and capabilities of the controller and of the switch. On the controller side, OpenFlow support is critical, which standard is being supported, and which parts of the standard are being supported. Um, how well the automation is handled in the network, whether uh, it's fully automated or not. Um, the performance of the controller and uh, how it interacts with the switches in the network, uh, how it provides resiliency both on the link level, uh, on the controller level, and on the control path level. Controller should have a security and integration policy already integrated into it and should be able to support routing and programmability. That is a northbound interface to allow customers to build their own applications and drive policy into the network. Relative to the switch characteristics, uh, it's important to recognize what standards that the switch actually supports. We also have to understand from a switch standpoint, uh, what fields in the OpenFlow specification does the switch have the ability to make modifications for? And also, is this implemented in hardware or is it implemented in software? If it's implemented in hardware, it's going to be very fast according to the ASIC characteristics of the switch. If it's implemented in software, uh, there may be some challenges there depending on the speed of uh, execution of that code. The other area is performance and also the interfaces. Does the switch support 10 gig? Does it support 40 gig? Does it support 1 gig? Is there flexibility in the way that the controller can connect to the switch? Can it connect to a 1 gig port or can it connect to a 10 gig port? And also, is the switch a cut-through switch or is it a store and forward? If it's store and forward, there's going to be some latency. If it's cut-through, it's going to be extremely fast. And also, how fast these flow definitions can be set up and what the ability is of that switch to have characteristics that are very amenable to the data center environment. Does it have load sharing power supplies? Does it have dual and redundant fans? Does it have uh, the ability to uh, receive uh, multiple AC inputs, for example? And in terms of scalability, it's important to recognize whether the switch uh, actually can handle uh, many flow table entries or only a few flow table entries. This will be important for how large the network is uh, and can these matches be done on the VLAN or, or layer two fabric pieces 
of the network or is it done uh, primarily in software? And also from an availability perspective, can the switch be able to uh, determine if uh, one controller has failed, it can go to another controller or have multiple failure scenarios, uh, you know, in, in terms of availability. And then uh, to the extent that the controller provides all of the uh, policies, does the switch have the ability to match the feature set as required in the policies that are being pushed? So these are some of the things that are very important to look at uh, when you're building an open flow fabric and evaluating vendors. Now, if we go to the final slide, uh, we primarily see that the open flow has actually moved beyond uh, research and uh, academia to enterprise and now IT. There are many key uses uh, of open flow, uh, multi-tenant capability for public and private clouds. Uh, as I mentioned in my previous presentation, the ability to maximize the utilization of uh, nodes and also be able to uh, provide for virtualization. Uh, and also the use cases of uh, creating a highly automated network and then the ability to have uh, various access control list policies and, and security and also uh, provide the network uh, in, in a multi-tenancy environment for segmentation and also the use cases as it relates to uh, resiliency and performance uh, in a network that may have specific classes of service. The IBM and NEC uh, collaboration really is a commitment to deliver a high-performance open flow solution that is standards-based, offers customers choice, and permits for uh, customers to utilize the network in the best way possible. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about the benefits of the IBM and NEC solution, we uh, look forward to having you do some research based on some of the QA links that we'll be providing later. Back to you, Stan. Well, thanks very much, uh, Don and Stuart. Uh, we're almost ready for the uh, Q&A segment of the webcast, but first we have our second and final audience poll question. That's going to appear on your screen, and here it is. And the question is, what are the most compelling benefits of OpenFlow SDN to you? And you may choose all that apply. Your choices are open standards-based, you don't want a proprietary software-defined network, reduced OPEX and CAPEX, flexible, gives more control, reduces complexity, scalability, or finally, automate business policy and add network applications. And once again, you can choose more than one of those, and then uh, don't forget to press the Submit Answer button. And uh, while we're waiting for our audience to make their selections and so that we can tally the results, uh, panelists, um, any thoughts as to uh, how our audience might vote on these? I would say certainly are all, all are important, but uh, any one that might seem more, more or most important to you? Yeah, hi, this is Stuart from IBM. I think when you look at some of the uh, important areas in uh, networking and the collaboration between various departments to make the network operate and be in alignment with the applications, uh, bringing as much manageability to the network as, as possible is key and automating that. So I think reducing complexity is going to be a, a key area, a compelling benefit. We're also seeing customers very interested in getting more control over their network and the way that traffic moves across their network. Uh, so having that uh, greater granularity of control is, is probably going to be of high interest. All right. Uh, Cindy, any thoughts? I would really agree with um, Ms. Stewart and Don. Um, it, it seems to me that, you know, the giving the flexibility and giving control is, is really important in what I'm hearing from customers. All right. Well, we do see the results uh, that are up now, and um, really very strong results for, I think, every category, uh, no question about it. Um, the, um, e each of those factors is important in our audience, and because people could vote for more than one, maybe we had some people choosing a lot of them. Uh, however, we do see a flexibility uh, and um, open standards-based uh, as a uh, the top choices there. Any final thoughts about that before we go to the audience Q&A? Yeah, I think that uh, customers today are really looking to uh, not be tied to a single vendor when it comes to the, uh, the switching elements of the network. Uh, they would like to have an open environment so they can make choices based on the requirements as the requirements evolve and as vendors uh, develop technology that can meet those requirements. All right. Well, let's dive immediately into the audience Q&A. And we do have a number of good questions. Let's go to the first one. 
First question is, is OpenFlow limited to data center type of network, or could it be used as well by service providers to extend their wide area network and maybe interconnect data centers? And uh, Don, maybe you could take that one. Thanks, Dan. Uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interest from a number of carriers and service providers uh, in applying OpenFlow to solve some of the challenges that they have today. Um, a lot of the applications um, do look like cloud-type applications where they're looking to solve some of the uh, same challenges that data centers are trying to solve in terms of, uh, you know, getting that same Layer 2 flexibility um, but the scalability of Layer 3. Uh, but they're also looking at a number of new applications uh, that are that OpenFlow enables uh, uniquely. So, for instance, being able to steer traffic uh, across the network for particular applications uh, or build uh, larger wide area services that don't have some of the limitations of traditional Layer 2 networks uh, are both of, a, of high interest. All right, next question. Will OpenFlow switches coexist with new edge network technologies like Trill, Cisco, FabricPath, Juniper, QFabric, et cetera? And Stuart, perhaps you could take that one. Sure, Stan. I think when you look at networking today, one of the key areas that uh, you even saw in the uh, survey is that customers want uh, an open uh, technology where they can uh, plug and play with potentially different vendors and not have any implications to the network. So I think when you consider uh, technologies outside of OpenFlow, uh, the whole idea is to have uh, the technology be open. So that's a, a, a serious concern. So with some of the newer technologies that are coming out now, uh, there may be some complementary needs within OpenFlow. And, and certainly as we talk to customers and we make presentations to them and they tell us the types of features that are important to them, uh, we'll definitely be making recommendations to the standards bodies, the Open Networking Foundation. Next question. Can OpenFlow provide benefits to a global federated network of service-oriented data centers? Uh, Don, could you handle that? What we're seeing right now is that customers are deploying in single and dual data centers uh, to solve particular problems that they have within their network. Um, but our vision is that the OpenFlow capability will spread beyond uh, just the data center to service a variety of challenges that uh, exist within the networks today. All right, next question. Uh, going back to you, I think, Don. Uh, how is OpenFlow helpful in managing spanning tree protocol? Well, uh, with NXC's implementation, we actually eliminate the, the need for spanning tree. Uh, building on top of OpenFlow, we have built uh, a network operating system uh, within the NEC programmable flow controller that provides the benefits of a Layer 2 network, that is uh, a flat network, uh, with the scalability of a Layer 3 network. We collapse these multiple levels into one large network, so customers have the control, the visibility across the network, uh, but don't have the limitations that uh, typical uh, layer, multi-layer networks designs uh, provide. Uh, so with a programmable flow, the controller, we can provide a multi-path network uh, that doesn't require any spanning tree but has higher levels of resiliency. Okay. We're going to go now to Cindy with a question. And the question is, even if my network has some inefficiencies, can't I count on hardware improvements to compensate for these by getting faster thanks to Moore's Law? Well, you know, I think that that is, um, I think that's absolutely true, right? That we are, um, look, there are um, inefficiencies that can be uh, solved by uh, Moore's law. But the but the issue is really when you think about OpenFlow, it's more about this idea of being able to leverage a community and and the flexibility that an open standard can bring so it's not i think if you if you were to talk to a lot of um uh different companies uh vendors in the market many of them will say well you don't need openflow because we're going to give you this functionality with our, with our with our product and but that that kind of misses the point which is that um with openflow you have this community um that can solve problems independent of any one single hardware product or any one single 
uh, portfolio from a provider. So I, I think that's why, you know, when we when we think about open flow, and I, I certainly am, am uh, excited about about the future of it. All right. A uh, quick follow-up for you before we close, uh, Cindy. What makes you convinced that open flow will be successful? Well, I mean, I guess I, you know, kind of mentioned that earlier, which is really when I when I think about open flow, um, you know, when when we did the poll earlier, um, I, I think the, the one of the number one uh, response respond the, uh, the answers was that you know the the folks on the line really thought that you know because it was an open standards based approach they were excited about open flow and and I think that that that's really the key here right is that we don't know and, and you know I've talked to so many customers and if, and if you think back five years um, would you really have known what would be on your network today and and the answer is no sure we we could have imagined that you know the bandwidth requirements would increase, but we we probably wouldn't have ima- imagined cloud taking off the way it has. We probably would not have imagined big data. Uh, we probably wouldn't have imagined um, the you know number of devices that are on uh, on the network. And so when you have um, a, a standard that is that can be a that can help the network adapt to changes, that can take advantage of a, of a community of developers, that can really um, help uh, organizations take advantage of the advancements in, in cloud architectures in your data center. I think that is why um, I'm certainly positive about OpenFlow going forward. All right. Well, thanks very much, Cindy. And thanks to all of our panelists. That is all the time we have in this Interactive Network World webcast. Many thanks to Cindy Barovic, Program Vice President for Enterprise and Data Center Networks at International Data Corporation, to Don Clark, Director of Business Development at NEC, and Stuart Raphael, Business Development Executive for IBM Systems Networking. Now, if we couldn't get to your question during the Q&A segment, uh, you should receive an email from us, or you can access the on-demand version of this webcast for additional resources. And thanks for joining us for IDC, NEC, and IBM. I'm Stan Gibson.